And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Have you ever heard that the New Testament, being written in Greek, is typically a Western preconceived idea? This documentary will challenge that cliché by exploring the roots of the Bible. A word about the Old Testament. Everybody with common sense and a minimal knowledge about Bible history scoffs at the Septuagint the translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek. It was useful at the time if you were Greek and didn't speak Hebrew and you wanted to read the Bible. But the very idea that it was the original Old Testament was ridiculous. As a matter of fact, it was so badly translated that it was like reading the NIV before times. All the numerical data was translated errors, and the whole thing was a corruption of Old Testament scripture from the 4th century BC. However, the same people who are aware of that and understand that and wouldn't touch the Septuagint with a 10 foot pole or any Old Testament translated from it, fall for the Greek primacy of the New Testament, which is not a purposeful attempt as a fraud, but an unnecessary detour from the true origins of the New Testament. Before you get angry and flame me for pulling the rug from under the King James Version of the Bible, David Martin and other flagship Bibles, let me remind you of Proverb. He that entereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Therefore, stay with me. Let's hear the matter and after you do, feel free to leave a comment, a question, or shoot me an email. But for now, please set this presentation to full screen. Put your phone on silent and shut off any distraction because this is very important, nay, fundamental in regards to the foundation of our faith. Before the end of this film, you will be provided evidence that about 80% of the New Testament was originally written in Aramaic including half of the four accounts of the Gospel. Not Hebrew, but Aramaic. Hebrew is actually a language using, um, at the time, the same alphabet as Aramaic, but descends from the Canaan language. Now, before we start, let me state the following controversial yet true facts. Aramaic was a lingua franca from the 3rd millennium BC until the 1st century AD. The Bible allows us to calculate that the flood occurred at um, 2618 BC. If my calculations are correct! 
if Pastor Anderson's calculations are correct. The flood happened in precisely 2618 BC. Here's why that's interesting. Because of the fact <laughs> that any history book that you read, any secular, non-Christian, totally worldly perspective history book, any history book will tell you that we only have historical records that start in 2500 BC. Every single one. I mean, look, I read a lot of books. I read a lot of history books. And they all talk about how civilization began in 2500 BC. You want to trace the Egyptian civilization back? That's how far you're going to trace it. And the Tower of Babel being struck and the nations being scattered occurred around 2518 BC. The third millennium BC means from the year 3000 to the year 2000 before Christ. So we are in that range. So both Bible history and secular history line up for Aramaic to be nothing less than the original language because of King Cyrus dating history matches the Bible's uh, account. Indeed, the Bible doesn't say that God changed Babel's language. Uh, Babylon was where the door of Babel was. Let me state that again. God divided the languages and scattered all nations. But there is nothing to say that he changed the language spoken where all the other nations departed from, the city of Babylon. The Babylonians kept the same language they spoke before the Tower of Babel was struck, which was the oldest form of Aramaic, uh, the root language of mankind. Starting from the year 100 AD, the language is called Syriac. Uh, throughout this movie, I will use Syriac and Aramaic interchangeably because the legacy New Testament we have is technically Syriac, but was written in Aramaic before it was called Syriac. Aramaic was a language usable all the way from India even from the Great Wall of China and to Ethiopia and had many dialects uh, but one common root. The Aramaic dialect spoken in Ethiopia was called Amharic. Back to the root. The Aramaic of Daniel, uh, the prophet, is referred to as Syriac in the King James Bible, which was the Aramaic dialect uh, spoken by the Assyrians and the Chaldeans. It is the closest lineage to the post-first century Syriac, but has evolved over time somehow. The Chaldeans in Daniel um, were the wise men of Chaldea, captured by the Assyrians, just like the Jews with Daniel. They were a neighboring people with higher intelligence than the Assyrians, but a lesser military expertise, um, serving Babylon after losing Nineveh as prophesied in Nahum, yet talking the same language. The closest remains of the Aramaic of Daniel can be found uh, in uh, the city of Palmyra, which became famous when uh, ISIS terrorists started to wreck uh, monuments. There are also many Aramaic uh, messages on the walls have been translated to Greek. Syriac has several alphabets. Old Testament Syriac uses the same font and alphabet as Hebrew did. Um, post first century Syriac has a writing that looks like this. And subsequent modernized Syriac uses this kind of writing. The modern dialects also have several different names, such as Neo Syriac, Turoyo, Sureth, Marboyo a.k.a. Maroya. We will begin to demonstrate Aramic primacy from one of the best Bibles translated from the Greek manuscripts. The King James Bible. In my opinion, the best Bibles translated from the Greek, uh, from the Greek are the French Bible version David Martin, uh, 1707 or 1744, and the Dutch Staten Vertaling, uh, the legacy Bible of Erasmus himself. 
Once Aramic primacy can be demonstrated from the King James version of the Bible, all lesser slash newer Bible translations and all the other flagship translations of the Greek New Testament in other uh, languages will fall under the same logical key. Let me state that there is no problem with the King James Old Testament since it was translated from the true source languages. Everybody agrees the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, uh, except for Genesis, uh, Egar Sahadutha in 31-47, Ezra 4-8-6-18, uh, 7-12-26, Jeremiah 10-11, and Daniel from 2-4-7-28, which were seamlessly translated from Aramaic. There is no translation error in the King James Old Testament, as far as I know. My um, whistleblowing of the Emperor James' lack of clothes is justified only by uh, mistakes in the New Testament, which I will explain uh, soon. Bear with me. The Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke Aramaic as his first native language. Of course, uh, when he was preaching in the synagogue, he would speak Hebrew. But his first language, the one he grew up in, was Aramaic. If that fact still meets reefs of ignorance, let me start over and prove it to you from the King James Bible. In Matthew uh, 5.22, the Bible reads, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. The word Raka is an Aramaic word to express contempt. 624, the Bible says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and Mammon. The word Mammon is not yet another alias for the devil, but an Aramaic word for materiality, material things, possession, riches, which is the word Mamuna. The 19th century theory that Mammon was a Syrian deity is a fraud by Milton. 2746, the Bible says, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Lamasabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, verse 47, when they heard that, said, This man called for Elias. That Eli, Eli, Lamasabachthani, there, uh, that is transcribed in the scripture itself in English, is Aramaic language. The Jewish crowd from Jerusalem did not understand uh, what Jesus said because they spoke Hebrew, not Aramaic. That's why they say maybe he called for Elias. Also, it makes sense that when you are in intense pain, you will express yourself in your own language. There is no record whatsoever in the Bible of Jesus ever speaking Greek, during his, uh, during his human experience. He only mentions Alpha and Omega in spirit form in uh, Revelation. There is a consensus, even amongst Greek premises, that Matthew was written in Syriac, uh, in Aramaic. Many of them think of it as Hebrew, but it was actually Aramaic. Now, that it was also translated to Hebrew, that is a possibility. Mark was also written in Aramaic as witnesses, as witnesses this parallel verse. Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani! Which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The difference between Eli and Eloi probably stems from nuances in the vowels that were not accented in writing at the time of Jesus. 
both the Peshitta and the old Syriac Sina, uh, the old Syriac Sinaitic Palimpest says Eloi, Eloi in Matthew 27:46. These differences do appear in the Aramaic received text, the Ahaburis Codex, proving not just Matthew, but both Matthew and Mark were originally written in Aramaic. Since it is an already known fact that Matthew was written in Aramaic, this differentiation being necessarily and sufficiently explained by the differences between Aramaic spelling in parallel passages in Matthew and Mark, this is definitive and overwhelming evidence that Mark was also written in Aramaic. Luke and John were written in Greek though, that's why they don't have this transliteration. More on this later. Before I show you the smoking gun evidence covering for the rest of the New Testament, you might wonder, why are there so few Aramaic manuscripts? The first reason is the Mongols, Genghis Khan and his dynasty were targets of, nego of negotiations to become Christians in the Oriental Church. They are still using Oriental Church symbols to this day, even without noticing. But the Roman Catholic Church interfered and demanded the Khan to bow down before their idiotic Pope, which the Khan refused. Then the Muslims proposed their religion as an alternative and the Mongols fell for it. Later on, they ransacked all the Assyrian cities and their libraries and on one occasion threw all the books in the Yarmouk River, which was blue from the book's ink for seven days, all the way until Jordania. The King James translators themselves didn't claim to be inspired, as they explained in their preface that was included in the King James Bible in the late 1850s. I believe the Old Testament translation in the King James Version is perfect, but not the New Testament. The Greek manuscripts have five different sources. When you go to the website Duhrana, where you can compare verses from Greek and Aramaic sources, it lets you choose the Greek source you want. Westcott Hort, 1881, combined with Nestle Alan 27 variants, Byzantine, Stephen's um, 1550TR combined with Scrivener's 1894TR, Tischendorf 8, uh, and the official Greek Orthodox Church New Testament. Two of these sources are dual, which brings up the number of Greek sources to seven, which is the true one. The King James Version is based mostly on Stephanus and Textus Receptus and some resources by Theodore Beza and other documents, including occasional Aramaic manuscripts. The Syriac New Testament, on the other hand, can be traced to one source, the Peshitta, a complete New Testament compiled, according to a conservative estimate, in the 5th century, containing 22 out of the 27 classical New Testament books, missing 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. This preserved copy of the Peshitta is called the Chaburis Codex. The Chaburis is itself a copy of the New Testament received by the Assyrians in the first century through King Abgar of Edessa, who spoke Syriac Aramaic, not Greek, not Hebrew. He received it by the hands of the Apostle Thaddeus from the 70, who evangelized King Abgar in his own tongue Syriac Aramaic. Abgar got saved and got most of people in Edessa saved by making Christianity the official state religion. Edessa was located in the region today occupied by the Ottomans, calling the province Sanyurfa in Turkey. The five missing books were later translated from Greek back to Aramaic and incorporated by the Syriac Church of the West into their New Testament called the Peshitto, while the Eastern Syriac Church separated from them over doctrinal issues, keeping uh, exclusively 22 books Peshitta. The Western Syriac Church is the original Antioch Church and considers 
the five belated books to be the word of God as well, but because their people did not receive them from the hands of the apostles as they did with the 22 other books of the New Testament, it is not found in the older Peshitta. For example, Revelation was written circa 90 AD. So it's only expected that the Assyrians uh, wouldn't receive it before it was written and then had to include it later uh, with gloves, which is understandable since when you are the only people uh, or nation receiving the 22 first New Testament books from the apostles themselves, you will naturally uh, oppose a slight amount of resistance or frowning to books you will receive only later um, through messengers or angels. But don't take the Assyrians' word for it, let us examine a critical mistake in the King James New Testament. This is the smoking gun, the fulcrum point, the lock to which the Peshitta is the key the glitch in the King James skin that gives away that is not the final authority, but another layer to peel. Open your eyes, clear your ears, sit down, buckle up and listen to the Holy Spirit, because this will challenge your understanding of scripture for the greater. Consider Romans 5, 6 to 8 in the King James Version. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And here is the person passage in the Peshitto and the Peshitta using the Murdoch translation. And if at this time, on account of our weakness, Messiah died for the ungodly, for rarely doth one die for the ungodly, though for the good someone perhaps might venture to die. God hath here manifested his love toward us, because if when we were sinners, Messiah died for us, how much more shall we now be justified by his blood and be rescued from wrath by him? And then with yourself. Which passage makes the most sense? Which is one continuous thought? Christ means Messiah. Our use of the word Christ reminds us he has been crucified. But essentially those two words are the same. In Aramaic the Bible says Meshiha. The Syriac source delivers this verse correctly. Now, when you go back to the Aramaic, there isn't really a neighboring word that would explain this mistake. I did find this one video that claimed to have found this translation mistake based on one segment of the handwriting missing an accent, and that would exactly match the difference in translation found in the Peshitta and Peshito and the Greek-based New Testaments. But the vocabulary 
divergence, the author claim could not be verified with the sources I consulted independently. So to avoid corrupt evidence, it is being excluded from this discussion. The problem with Syria, because it's Aramaic, is that you will run into people propping up false translations of actual words to serve a third-party agenda. And because of the scarcity of actual experts, translations are difficult to verify. It's not like you can open a one-stop dictionary like in Greek. Um, there are many partial dictionaries, and beyond that, uh, you need to master the Aramaic alphabets and their nuances in the first place. That's why it's safer to involve native Assyrians from any diaspora in the world who don't have to travel to Syria, who have learned and taught this language all their lives, transmitted from generation to generation in addition to a modern language. I only have put in this film translations I verified with native Assyrians. The law of my mouth is that I do not make claims before I can substantiate them with serious research. The only intelligent explanation about Romans 5-7 in the wake of this mistake in the King James Bible and other Bibles translated from the Greek is that the book of Romans was written in Aramaic and immediately or shortly after translated to Greek for delivery. When you discuss a subject you know Sometimes you make a slippery mistake by seeing a word opposite to what you're thinking. And the people around you uh, who are on the same wavelength will automatically understand it was just a lapsus and interpret or filter out that mistake. This must be what happened here. Paul was actually meaning to write, for rarely doth one die for the ungodly, and said, write it. Or he did say ungodly, but his Greek translator wrote down righteous twice and nobody noticed because that's a kind of mistake that goes unnoticed when you uh, think out loud or proofread a manuscript in diagonal, respectively. Every New Testament translated from the Greek makes this mistake, while the Syriac New Testament does not. Furthermore, Romans 5, 6 says in the KGV, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. The word that is ungodly there in the KGV is the same word in Aramaic that the KGV calls a righteous man in verse 7. So what? I'll tell you what. The KGV does correctly translate from the Greek ungodly with the same root word in Aramaic in Acts 2.23 and 2 Timothy 3.2 unholy, which is close enough given the context. Proving beyond the shadow of a doubt that the book of Romans was translated to Greek with a mistake added in the Greek manuscript. Even for Greek apologists, it is an undisputed fact that the Gospel according to Matthew was written in Aramaic. As I said, many of them mistakenly think it was written in Hebrew, but it was actually written in Aramaic. Their confusion about Semitic languages does not shadow the fact they admit Matthew was not written in Greek. Jesus of Galilee's native language was Galilean Aramaic, as was the Apostles' native language. And Syriac Aramaic differs slightly from Galilean Aramaic. Keep in mind Syriac Aramaic or Syriac, the language of the, that the Old Testament uh, mentions Daniel has learned during his captivity in Babylon, was different from the Aramaic dialects from the time of Jesus by, reason of, uh, by reasons of geography and evolution. In any case, Syriac Aramaic is so much more closer to Galilean Aramaic than Greek, an uh, entirely uh, different language. Hello, the
lapsa pianneen aloo, haaslen tunoi, vitai, rsiai, waskatun, wakatun. Mehun, nainusho, urashmen, rafshun, urashmei, kesfun, shabrahone, rumme. Let me now address the so-called Hebrew Roots Movement, which is a sham by Judaizers and Zionists. What they do is they, they hijack the real source of the New Testament, which is in the Aramaic language, in the Syriac Peshitta. They try to interpret it to the benefit of the Hebrew language. This is a move by the Jewish diaspora to weaken the Assyrians and distract the Christians from the true origins of the New Testament, which are Syrians. There's no one anything to tell me. Intelligence tells us that the bulldozers used by Islamic State terrorists in Syria to wreck Assyrian temples and monuments thousands of years old had the inscription, this is for Nebuchadnezzar in Hebrew written on them. Indeed, these bulldozers were given to ISIS by the rogue nation calling itself Israel and occupying Palestine. This country and ISIS, our sibling pre-existing terrorist groups in Syria and Iraq, cooperated for years behind the scenes because Israel wants in Syria a weak neighbor. And in exchange, ISIS, ISIS did not attack Israel which provided them and their terrorists medical healthcare, weapons, ammunition, logistics, and intelligence on Syrian army targets. Israel also committed military aggression against Syria on dozens of, of occasions since 2012 under the pretext of striking Hezbollah, stabbing Hezbollah in the back while they were helping the Syrian army against ISIS terrorists or their predecessors. Now, since Trump happened, Israel withdrew the most of their support to ISIS, and thanks to Russia, now ISIS is losing the Syrian war, but so much, so much harm was done for several years. I will not go here uh, into the atrocities committed by Islamic terrorists in Syria, even before the Islamic State. However, I will just mention the physical salvation provided by the Russian Air Force was God's answer to prayers of Syrian Christians not to have their entire country and culture annihilated by bloodthirsty Islamic terrorists. The Syrian war as a whole resembles to a small scale uh, to a rehearsal of the post-tribulation rapture with the Russian Air Force representing Jesus Christ, as visually suggested in my revisit of After the Tribulation. You may say, Ben, this example about Romans 5 is striking. But I still believe the Greek New Testament's claim is the correct one, and you have to interpret it in its demands. Uh, maybe it's just sarcasm about people thinking themselves to be righteous. Well, it's not the only mistake you can reasonably broom under the carpet. You see, the Gospel, according to Matthew, was written in Aramaic. That is a known fact. Mark also. Now, let's examine some other problems that arose when the Aramaic received text from Matthew's account of the Gospel was translated into Greek. Matthew 5.3, the King James Version says, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This verse translation alone should make any saved Christian cringe. Yet millions of KGV and other Greek and Bibles believers have read this verse dozens of times and didn't even take. Why would the poor spirit, the spiritually inept, own the kingdom of heaven? Now, the traditional interpretation of that uh, version of Matthew 5.3 is that poor in spirit there uh, just means humble, meek, 
as suggested in Isaiah 5715 and 662. is a mistake. And mind you, this isn't a translation mistake on behalf of the King James translators, because it is in other flagship Bible translated from the Greek as well. This is a translation mistake from Aramaic to Greek. You may say, we already know Matthew was not originally written in Greek. We were in Romans. Why do you go back from Romans to Matthew? And what does this have to do with the rest of the New Testament? Acts, Romans, Epistles. Consider Matthew 5.3 in the Aramaic. Even the English translations of the Syriac manuscripts make this mistake, but please keep in mind the mistake is not in the Aramaic text. The word maskani, maskan plus the letter I which is said E. In Aramaic means whose home. The phony dots that you see here on the second letter of a miskin, miskin, indicate this letter should be read as an A, changing the word poor, miskin, to home, maskin. The phony dots, however, were only implemented at the end of the first century. Before that, oral tradition and contextual understanding would define the meaning of the pronounced word. The old Syriac Sinaitic palimpest in proper fonts supports the correct spelling, but the Peshitta does not. The old Syriac Sinaitic palimpest is a manuscript older than the Kaburis, which is a copy of the first century Peshitta, but not older than the Peshitta. Also, the old Syriac palimpsest only features the Gospel and is not a complete New Testament to Assyrian standards. So this verse actually says, if you want a literal translation, a heavenly attitude is theirs, those whose home is in the Spirit. Theirs is a heavenly state. Or, if you want a phrasing closer to the King James Version, we translate it as, Blessed are those whose home is in the Spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, blessed are those whose home it is to walk in the Spirit, which means those who are saved. Even if you are saved, you still sin when you don't walk in the Spirit. You don't successfully not sin by struggling not to sin. You don't sin when you walk in the Spirit. That's the whole teaching from 1 John which was included in the Peshitta, by the way. Back to this verse, which is a parallel verse to Galatians 5.16 and fits the rest of the teaching of the New Testament, and like the Greek manuscripts translated from the Aramaic originals before Aramaic scribes thought to implement the dotting accent as they were slowly moving from predominantly oral tradition to written legacy for the purpose of spreading the gospel. This evidence not only proves overall army primacy in time of the New Testament, but also proves the Assyrian claim that the Peshitta was written before the end of the first century, confirming the historical fact that Thaddeus the Apostle brought the Gospel to Odessa before Revelation was written, and thus explaining why the Peshitta was missing the five believed books of the New Testament we use today.
If you were a hardened KGV unmaced, this verse should give you pause. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a Judaizer. I love God and I love the Word of God, so I want to know what it really says. I do not worship a translation. I want to peel that unnecessary, belated layer of Greek translation and throw it away. Now that we know that any Bible translated from the Greek manuscripts, pick whichever you like best, is merely the translation of a translation, why do you think a spirit-filled pastor like Pastor Anderson preaches this with momentum and without hesitation? Well, I, th I think it's just a departure like the rapture. And ecclesia means the calling out. Don't even come at me with that going back to the Greek. And listen. If anybody starts going back to the Greek to make their point, just zone out. You know what I mean? Just speak English. Even though he thinks, he still thinks the New Testament was written in Greek, he just knows he should not go back to the Greek, quote unquote because deep down he knows it's a waste of time, he just doesn't know why. So, garlic sauce lover, pre-triber, who said, I remind people, however, that any translation is simply a translation. That to really understand the Bible as it was written, you have to read it in Greek, New Testament. Should really say, I remind people, however, that any translation is simply a translation. That to really understand the Bible as it was written, you have to read it in Greek, New Testament. A word about Yeshua. Yeshua is just Jesus' name in Aramaic. So when Judaizers says, uh, they say, did you know his real name was Yeshua? They are actually right. but. Then when they say, you have to pray to Yeshua and not Jesus, or you're getting the wrong name, they are so very wrong because God knows the hearts and lets you call Jesus in your own language. The names may vary slightly according to the language, but the word of God is the same in any language, provided it is translated properly. Now, you don't make an omelette without breaking eggs, and you don't pull a carpet without breaking porcelain. So let me address a few frequently uttered objections. The Kaburis source tree denies the Trinity because it doesn't have 1 John 5, 7. No, it doesn't. The fact that this verse is missing the Peshitta just means it has been added into the Greek translation to clarify verse 6 since it is likely an apostle or the direct companion of an apostle who was doing the translation in Greek. This verse is inspired, but it's a clarification of the previous verse. Anyway, you can clearly understand and define Trinity from the rest of the New Testament. Furthermore, this verse is restored in the murder translation of the Peshitta. The same phenomenon happens for other dear verses to legacy KGV on the East. They will be included in the murder translation with a footnote. There are over 5,000 Greek manuscripts available, but only scarce Aramaic manuscripts. Have a look at the catalogue of Syriac manuscripts from the British Museum, acquired between 1838 and 1870, or go to London and visit their Assyrian wing. Uh, plus, I already explained what the Mongols did. We don't have an inspired, one-stop version of the Assyrian Bible, or a Bible translated from Aramaic like the King James Version. So it can be the source of the source language of the New Testament, because God said he would preserve his word. Well, it did, since the Assyrian New Testament is available in English alone in three old translations, Murdoch, Etheridge, 
Lamsa, and one modern translation, AENT, from AENT.org. I haven't proved read it, uh, but it's there. Plus, uh, the Bibles translated from uh, Greek aren't that bad. You just have a few mistakes, which you can correct yourself with a pen while watching this uh, documentary. A minor inconvenience compared to the NIV and other Frankenstein Bibles with 400 plus corruptions. Uh, the worst, uh, most satanic corruption to this day being the NET that uh, James White reads. If you want the best of both worlds, I recommend, I do recommend the Murdoch translation of the Syriac New Testament from 1858. And to make sure your copy hasn't been adjusted, I recommend the Forgotten Books edition, a classic, uh, classic reprint series, which is a facsimile of the 1858 edition without the comments, without comments, but with the original marginal notes. This translation is faithful to the Syriac original New Testament, um, yet includes references, verses, and uh, the five belated books found in the Greek TR. You yourself explained that some of the New Testament books have... Some of the New Testament books still have been written in Greek. That's right. By the Assyrians on admission, the epistles of 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, Jude and the Book of Revelation have been translated backwards from Greek into Aramaic to be included in the Western edition of the Peshitta called the Peshitta. But everybody knows the Gospel according to Matthew was written in Aramaic, so there is a precedent. I proved that Mark and then the epistles to the Romans were written in Aramaic and later translated to Greek. So the recipient of an epistle does not necessarily determine the language of the original version. Otherwise, um, the epistle to the Romans would have been written in Latin. Yet Paul wasn't fluent enough to write in Latin, at least before he got to live in Rome, so he wrote it in Aramaic, as demonstrated. Now, the Kabbalist itself gives away that the Gospel according to Luke and the Gospel according to John were written in Greek, using the formulation. Now ends the preaching of Luke, which he preached in Greek, in the great city of Alexandria. And now I begin to write the Holy Gospel according to the preaching of John the Apostle. And later on, now I have finished writing the Holy Gospel according to the preaching of John the Apostle, which he, which he uttered in Greek in Ephesus the great metropolis of Asia. Now I do begin, with the help and power of Christ, to write the Acts of the Holy Apostles. There are many other handwritten interchapter comments, none of which mentions the Greek again. Luke mentions the Aramaic word mammon, though, but we are going to give Luke the benefit of the doubt. So therefore, the Gospel according to Matthew was written in Aramaic, so was the Gospel according to Mark. It can be speculated though that both Mark and Luke themselves could have been translators to Greek of many Aramaic manuscripts, which could make some Greek texts original translations. But it is not possible to determine which ones without going through uh, the New Testament in Greek and in Aramaic with a fine comb uh, comparing the source text for discrepancies. Since I proved the Book of Romans was originally written in Aramaic to a Latin-speaking nation, the rest of the Eastern canon beyond the four accounts of the Gospel must have been translated from the Aramaic original to Greek manuscript since the Kabbalist does not mention anything about Greek beyond Luke and John, with the reserve proactively conceded for 1 John, since the Peshitta admits the Gospel according to John was uttered by himself in Greek. So, to recapitulate, Matthew and Mark were written in Aramaic, Luke and John were written in Greek, all the other books of the New Testament have been written in Aramaic, except 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, 
Jude, Revelation, and maybe 1 John. This is the only logical deduction stemming from the smoking gun evidence found in Romans 5. That's 19 or 20 out of the 27 New Testament books that were originally in Aramaic and 7 or 8 books that were written in Greek. So about 3 quarters of the New Testament books were originally written in Aramaic and a quarter in Greek. I haven't computed the volume of versions, but they should be around 80% to Aramaic. You can't tell how old the Kabbalist really is because I don't believe in carbon-14 dating. Carbon dating is accurate for at least 5,000 years, up to 10,000 years, and after that you fall back into the radioactive knots. But even if you don't believe that scientific facts about radioactive decay, Archdeacon Sadou de Marchimun, an authority on the Peshitta, claims it Holophon ascribed it to the first decade of the 3rd century, or sometime between 200 and 209 AD. Assyrians scholars place the copy that we hold around the 5th century. Yet, it doesn't matter if the scriptures were translated from Aramaic to Greek 10 minutes, 10 years, or 400 years, that matter, after the original in Syriac was written, it still makes the Greek manuscripts a translation, and the Greek derived Bibles translations of a translation, including the King James Bible. In any case, the Kabbalist codex that exists is a copy of manuscripts dating from the 1st century, as I proved from the Matthew 5.3 accent nuance. Now, if you are using a decent Greek and Bible, such as KGB or David Martin, you don't have to throw it away. Just take a pen and correct the verses exposed in this presentation. But eventually, you might want to switch to the Murdoch or other translation from the Syriac of your choice, um, to, to fix Matthew 5.3 in there as well. And if you have a lot of time in your hands, you can also choose to learn Aramaic from ethnic Assyrians and read the New Testament in the original. But that's another story. Then Rezin, king of Syria, and Reka, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war. And they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. At that time, Rezin, king of Syria, recovered Elath to Syria and drove the Jews from Elath. And the Syrians came to Elath and dwelt there unto this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord, and in the treasures of the king's house, and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria hearkened unto him, for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus, and took it, and carried the people of it captive to Kir, and slew reason. I knew he should be marle. I mean, I mean, a marnolo. The nosh clomet here at Menrish, no miskah nesi makuthi dano. Metud kurhun tau, who has here in Menchebuh de dalo. Idahun tonne, then Ulum Hayem, who had to hear one side, who caught to lay, who zanoi, who harosh, who for high fat he. Who could hun da golem no thodil hun. The Amtho Hoy, the Octo, Nuru Cabrito, Hoy Lithim Auto, Hautaniono. The Hurto Dain, Dahtitho, Mautau, Mahapte, Daloho, Hautan Lam, Moran Yeshua, Shiho. Haut Katithau, Bakmuto Daloho. Loeh tu Fio Hashbo, Hodetithau Fehmo Daloho. Hurkum Hawe Loho, who made a Rotan. Then God had to hear it sign when she hoped I'll find me. Como o hil yatiroid desda dog, o shobane ubinefase men rumzo. 
به یک دن فرکانا و بعد میشکانا دختوه اخوت را تد بوده و انتاده فرما مارن شوه و تحیمن بله باختره ها اکیمه من بیث می تیه و فرین در این دختی بون داد حیمنون جشو مشیه و بره دلوه و مد حیمنتون ده اون خون باش می های دلوار کورگر نکرش من مور یو نیه من دای همین باب رو ایفلی حیی در اولم و من رو مد فی اسلام رو رو نحسی حیی نهورد زی دلو انقاو علاو Thank you.